Good morning, everybody. <coughs> I don't like what Howard says. I find myself in an awesome place this morning. For I'm talking God's word. And I trust that you will hear what he has to say. But let's read it. 1 Kings 22. Pardon? Oh. Go on. Is that better? Yeah, perfect. Oh, okay. 1 Kings 22, uh, from verse 29 onwards. This is what it says. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and go into battle, but you put on your robes. So the king of Israel disguised himself and went into battle. Now the king of Syria had commanded the 32 captains of, the char of his chariots, saying, Fight with no one small or great, but only with the king of Israel. So it was when the captains of the chariots saw Jehoshaphat that they said, Surely this is the king of Israel. Therefore they turned aside to fight against him, and Jehoshaphat cried out. And it happened when the captains of the chariots saw that it was not the king of Israel that they turned back from pursuing him. Now a certain man drew a bow at random and struck the king of Israel between the joints of his armor. So he said to the driver of his chariot, Turn around and take me out of the battle, for I am wounded. The battle increased that day, and the king was propped up in his chariot, facing the Syrians, and died at evening. The blood ran out from the wound onto the floor of the chariot. Then, as the sun was going down, a shout went throughout the army, saying, Every man to his city, and every man to his own country. So the king died and was brought to Samaria, and they buried the king in Samaria. Then someone washed the chariot in a, in, at a pool in Samaria, and the dogs licked up his blood while the, cha while the harlots bathed according to the word of the Lord, which he had spoken. Now the rest of the acts of Ahab and all that he did, the ivory house which he built, and all the cities that he built, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? So Ahab rested with his fathers. Then Ahaziah, his son, reigned in his place. Uh, we're going to look around verse 34 that says, Now a certain man drew a bow at random and struck the king of Israel between the joints of his armor. I just read a salient part of this chapter, but it might be good if you later on go through the whole chapter and find the whole story. But I've been reading over the, through the Bible over a period of time and I've noted several incidents happening. For instance, Nothing dramatic, but something just happened. For instance, this, when the servant of Abraham was by a well praying that he would find a suitable girl for his father's son, or sorry, his master's son, as soon as he finished praying, Rebecca comes along. Later, Isaac, the father, blessed that deceitful Jacob. And then, Esau appeared right at that time. When Saul the king intruded into the office of the priest, he offered a sacrifice at that very moment. When he had finished, Samuel comes. Esther, we find that she was, well, inquiring in or about the day when the king was inquiring how he should honor Mordecai for a it was Mordecai that stopped an assassination attempt on the king's life. What will I do? And at that moment, who should be in the courtyard but Haman? And the tables turned. So many things just happened. Just happened. Some little while ago, I did a certain particular thing. I just felt. And later on, I was told, a person said to me that I acted with 
that was a divine appointment. There are things, friends, which you do are by divine appointments. In our reading, we read there about a certain man drew a bow at random. So let's see what we can learn from this. Who was that man? A mere soldier in an army in battle. It's not a place that any of us would like to be in. At that time, there was no tanks, there was no missiles, no bombs, no, nothing pinpointed by laser or anything like that, man to man. This was a situation where probably the man would not like to be in. He would rather be at home. But on that day, all he had was a bow. That bow was not for defense, but for attack. When someone was against him, well, he could fire. He, did, if, he may have had a shield. He may have had something to protect him. Maybe a sword if he was attacked. But in this case, all he had was a bow. And so he goes into the quiver, takes out an arrow, puts it in, and lets fly. There was no aim, no direction, but the result of it all was that it struck the king of Israel. And that arrow, the pinpoint of that arrowhead, hit the king between the joints. Again, we can see a strange thing. Between the joints. This wasn't a chance. It just happened. The Bible says it was a random shot. Some would say coincidence. An accident. Chance. Some would say luck. Fate. But there is a God who created this world, so wonderfully made it, and he is one who is unchanging, all-powerful. Let us not say, let people not say that God isn't concerned what goes on. He is concerned what goes on in this world and those who are living on his behalf. I put it to you that the hand of God is concerned in those events which some would say just chance. It just happened. It's not that people are mere machines or robots moved about by the hand of God. No, God has a place in it all. We all have a will. We all have minds to think. We have brains and intelligence and we can reason. We can decide by ourselves to do this or do that. But behind it all, there is a God who rules and overrules all things for his plans and his purposes. Do we not know he uses the fish of the sea, the laws of nature, the might of the wind and the waves, all for his praise and glory? He acts in your life and in mine, and he is actively engaged in things, as I've said, for his plan and purposes. Hannah, in her prayer, could say, the Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he lifts up. While a psalmist could say, he puts one down and he lifts and he exalts another. Notice how Pharaoh lost his life in the Red Sea he, as Moses was acting under the directions of God. Notice how Belshazzar's reign suddenly came to an end as the writing appeared in the wall which Daniel revealed, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. You have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. And that very night, Babylon was overthrown. Belshazzar killed, the kingdom divided. The Medes and the Persians gave way to the Greeks and then to the Romans. I'm sure we can think of the time when there was the great wall dividing Germany into east and west, but that's gone. Communistic USSR with its satellite nations all changed in a, in a remarkably short space of time. See how the Arab Spring has changed the face of the world. But I read that God takes note of the sparrow that falls on the ground he sees the great and the small. 
Second Chronicles 16 says, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts that are loyal to him. Not a thing passes our God. He never slumbers nor sleep. What people see as an accident comes to his attention. It is not a dishonor to God to suppose that he's working in those small little things. That unnamed warrior who without any aim or action fired an arrow into the air. Maybe he did not even know where that arrow was going, nor did he know the result. But he was doing something that brought about the fulfillment of the word of God. An arrow flying from a bow was the means of God's word coming to pass. Ahab was an evil king, one of the most evil. He cared nothing for God, about God. He did not concern himself with what belonged to God. The lot of Ahab wasn't a pretty one. During his 22 years of reign, there were frequent wars against the king of Syria, Ben-Hadad. But as this was going on, a prophet appears. He gives Ahab advice what to do against King Ben-Hadad. Strategy known only to him was revealed. It was Ahab, or it was the prophet that told Ahab what to do. And as he goes out to battle, he defeats Ben-Hadad, but strangely enough, he spares the king's life. Maybe he thought, this will help me with trade and commerce. God saw it another way. Because you have let slip out of your hand a man who I appointed to utter destruction, therefore your life shall go for his life, your people for his people. It wasn't long after that. Ahab found himself in the vineyard of Naboth. And a, a, a vineyard that he took. And God sent Elijah along to tell him words of condemnation and judgment. And Elijah said, the dogs would lick his blood. And concerning the nation, it was said that they would be scattered in the mountains of sheep having no shepherd. Like sheep having no shepherd. Another prophet, Micaiah, comes. And he tells Ahab similar words. Ahab didn't like it. So he takes that prophet and he puts him in prison. And as he goes along, the prophet says to him, if you ever return in peace, the Lord hasn't spoken by me. And then he turns and he looks at the people around the prophet and he says, take heed all you people. In other words, listen to what I've said. So many twists and turns. Ahab goes into battle. I will disguise myself. Put on your robes. So many twists and turns this way, that way. But the direction was given in the battle. Fight no one small or great. Only the king of Israel. So there they are. Ahab's your man. But Ahab's disguised. How can they find him? How can they look? Ah, there he is. But as they were going, it wasn't Ahab, it was Jehoshaphat. Oh, he, oh, what, he cried out as though, well, it's not me. <laughs> Please spare my life. And so they turn away. But a certain man drew a bow at random and struck the king of Israel between the joints of his armor. You see, God had spoken. God had said. And no disguise or whim of this man could alter that fact. In just the same way, many people today go just like Ahab along their evil ways, godless ways, and they think, all is well. I live as I like, but the Bible says, does it not? All have sinned. 
God clearly says that sin pays wages. Death and separation eternally from him in hell is the end. And it doesn't matter how one feels or thinks. The truth of God's word will never fail. One day we will all face our maker. But how will we stand before him on that judgment day? How? A random shot by an unknown soldier, an enemy soldier, brought the word of God to pass. Then we can learn from these words that no device of our own, nothing. We cannot hinder the word of God from coming to pass. We cannot stop the will of God from being fulfilled. As a man, as I've earlier said, Ahab did not consider God a lot in his life. He did evil to a high degree. It was he who married Jezebel. And with her encouraged Baal worship as a state religion in the nation. On the other hand, could Ahab forget the way Elijah acted on Mount Carmel, praying to God, fire coming down from heaven, and then destroying the prophets of Baal at the Brook Kidron. No person by themselves could do such a thing. The behavior of, of Elijah as he confronts Ahab in Naboth's vineyard, could he forget that? Maybe this was one of the reasons why he disguised himself in battle. You and I can't run away from God. We cannot halt the word of God from being fulfilled. People make attempts. Didn't Jonah run away from God and refuse to give warning to the people of Nineveh? But what did God do? <laughs> a storm? Throwing him overboard? A whale? One can sneer at God and the ways of God, but there's a conscience in all of our hearts and our lives Think of Judas. What did he do? He betrayed the Lord for 30 pieces of silver. And then he feels, well, I've done something wrong. He takes the money. Look, here's the money. Uh-uh. Can't alter it. And so he goes out and hangs himself. On the other hand, we're here this morning probably because in a moment of time, the Holy Spirit prompted us that we were on the wrong side of God and we turned to the Lord Jesus. Looking again at life, we can see that people know there are things that are certain, but they live as though they're not. The Holy Spirit tells us, whatever a man sows, he will reap. I've known Christians, and probably you have, who have lived for God all their lives wanting to honor him and glorify him, and then they find themselves in hard times. What are they going to do? We just don't know. But Father God knows, and knock at the door. A gift via the postman. And so much of what they have done now is being fulfilled. But there are others, yes, they've lived for God, and they've passed on. But now in eternity, they are rewarded, rewarded for what they have done. And so they take the crowns, but they give them back to the Lord. They've lived for him in life, and so in eternity, they give to him and honor him. It has to be noted again. There are people whose lives like Ahab are wretched. Whatever they do, whatever they think, their life is godless, they don't care a thing, but the scripture says in Hosea, they have sowed to the wind and reap a whirlwind. But as Christians, let us, like that man, go into the quiver and take out that bow and live for the Lord more and more, knowing, well, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. There are places we might go ourselves and we think, is there any use? Is there any purpose? Will it achieve anything? Maybe you've handed out a tract. Maybe you've spoken to a stranger in the street. And you think, but was there any purpose? But there's a God who sees. And there's a God who knows. In Canada, 
there was a particular pastor, he had a, a strong feeling that he should go to a lumber camp. He goes up there and he finds the place is empty. The, two, the, the, the equipment is there, but people are gone. Well, but then he thought, well, if God wanted me to come here, I better do what he said, what he wants me to do. So he goes into the mess room, and in front of tables and chairs, he starts preaching. And he talks about God, and he speaks, and so he goes on. And then when he finishes, he goes home. Was there any purpose? Years later, he, he along with others, was interviewing people to go into the ministry. And one came forward, one of the persons, and looks at him and said, do you know me? I've never seen you in my life. Well, he said, on a certain day at a particular time, yes, that lumber camp. Oh, yes. Well, he said, we had moved on somewhere else, but there was a bit of machinery that was missing, and I was told to go back and pick it up. And when I went back, I stood outside and I heard you preaching. And I listened to all that you said. And I gave my heart and my life to the Lord Jesus. And from that moment on, in like manner, there are promises in the Bible that are sure and certain. Some things we don't know and we act. We don't know the end of it all. But the Bible does tell us, don't boast about tomorrow for you don't know what a day will bring forth. There are two things that are certain. It's appointed unto man once to die. That's a sure thing. The second one is the judgment. We will all face our maker God. And when that arrow flew, it struck the king of Israel between the joints of his armor. And that point of the arrow went where probably a sword could not go. It can be said when Ahab was going into battle, he wasn't fully equipped. But he heard the words of the prophet. And maybe there was that concern in the disguise, but there was that chink in his armor. Are we not as Christians told in Ephesians 6 and 11 to put on the whole armor of God? Without going to get into detail, we live in a world and we cannot separate ourselves by isolation. We need to live and we need to mix. There's a work that has to be done. There are goods that have to be, have to be purchased. And in our employment, there are temptations that come to us in varying degrees. But let us glorify him in all things. Satan is an old foe. He comes at us with devices. And let us remember that we are children of a king. And although our lifestyle is different, we cannot shut out the spirit of the world that we're living in. So let us pray always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. And in this crooked and diverse and perverse world, let us live that life that is pleasing to him. We may I have to go into that arrow, that quiver, and take out that bow. But let us live the life in all things, endeavoring to please him what we do and what we say. Let us always shelter under that rock that is higher than I. For Jesus and through him, we can conquer and glorify him in all things, the big and the little. God bless you.